In our last video, we discussed the types of blood cells present in a typical blood smear. We ended by talking about this diagram, which shows the balance that normally exists between production and removal of blood cells. Normally, production equals removal, but tipping the scales in either direction will lead to either too many or too few of a given type of blood cell. These states are given a special name, denoted by certain suffixes. An increase in the number of a given type of cell is given the suffix cytosis, which is added to the prefix for the given cell type. White blood cells get the prefix leuco, red blood cells get the prefix erythro, and platelets get the prefix thrombo. So we can have, for example, leukocytosis, which is increased white blood cells, erythrocytosis, which is increased red blood cells, or thrombocytosis, which is increased platelets. A decrease in the number of cells of a given cell type gets the suffix penia, which I'll add here, or cytopenia, either one depending on the specific type of cell involved. So we could have something like leukocytopenia, which involves the prefix for white blood cells. So as you might guess, this would be a decrease in white blood cells. Or if we had a decrease in red blood cells, you might think it would be erythro, prefix for red blood cells, cytopenia, the suffix for a decrease in red blood cells, but that's actually not what it is. It's anemia. So a decrease in red blood cells gets the special name anemia. If we have a decrease in platelets, that would be thrombocytopenia. So since we now know that blood cells develop in the bone marrow, we now have a place to look if we need to get more information about hematopoiesis in a given patient. But in a patient with symptoms, how is the quality of the bone marrow assessed? There are two ways of doing so. The bone marrow needs to be taken out of the body to be examined, from the part of the bone here shown in red, either via a bone marrow biopsy or a bone marrow aspirate smear. So I'll put these two options down, biopsy and aspirate. So what's the difference between the two? The biopsy involves taking a piece of bone along with the marrow, while the aspirate is taking a sample of marrow only. In either case, the results of the test will be examined by a pathologist, who will see something like this. A normal bone marrow biopsy looks something like this, which is roughly 50-50 fat versus marrow. And in this picture, the marrow component is purple, whereas the fat are these clear circles. Because it's roughly 50-50 fat versus marrow, we call this normocellular. And we'll see pictures shortly of hypercellular and hypocellular and what those look like. A normal bone marrow aspirate looks something like this. And in this picture, you can see different types of cells growing on their way from immaturity towards maturity. And as they do so, they'll exit out into peripheral circulation as the cell types we discussed in the previous video. Now let's take a look at hypercellular and hypocellular bone marrow biopsy samples. This figure on the top right, we would call hypercellular. And the reason for that is because there's way more cellular component than fat component. The purple greatly outnumbers the clear. On the bottom right, on the other hand, we would call hypocellular because there's way more fat than there is cellular material. There are lots of different cell types in the aspirate and biopsy samples, and recognizing each individual cell and precursor cell is beyond the scope of this course, but it's still important to know generally how each cell develops. All blood cells are descendants of a common precursor cell, the hematopoietic stem cell. The stem cell commits to one of two cell lines, the myeloid cell line or the lymphoid cell line, which together develop into all of the other cell types. Before the mature stage, there's a number of intervening stages through which the cells must pass, each with their own characteristics and look under the microscope, just like the figure shows for the RBC. The same is true for the rest of the cells in the myeloid line, shown here. Platelets, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils and for the lymphoid line, shown here, which includes B cells and T cells. Because all these different cell types derive from the same precursor stem cell, they're all related to one another, even though they look very different and have different roles. Importantly, with each passage of the cell from one stage to another towards full maturity, the cell divides. So there's lots and lots of RBCs, fewer of the stage just before a mature RBC, the reticulocyte, and fewer and fewer cells as you go up towards the common precursor, the stem cell, 
there aren't very many of those relative to the number of other cells present in the bone marrow. These stem cells can be identified by the presence of CD34 on their surface, which disappears as they reach maturity. But how does a given stem cell know how to become a basophil, for example, or a T-cell? Let's figure that out, starting with this picture of a stem cell here on the right. It turns out the stem cell has receptors on its surface, which I'll show here in blue, that respond to various ligands in the environment, which I'll show here in orange and label like so. These ligands, when they bind to the receptors on the stem cell, induce it to divide and begin to differentiate towards a given cell type. For a red blood cell, for example, that ligand is erythropoietin, which was abbreviated EPO. And the presence of EPO induces this progenitor stem cell to begin dividing and dividing and dividing along its pathway to the left, ultimately resulting in a mature red blood cell. This pathway involves the binding of a ligand to a cell surface receptor, which induces transcriptional changes that drive the cell towards differentiation. Let's look at one example, the JAK-STAT pathway. Let's start off by drawing a blown up example of a cell. We have our plasma membrane out here, and we have our nucleus down here, which I'll label nucleus, which as we know, contains the DNA. And if any changes to cell behavior need to take place, we need to have some sort of signal transduction from the outside of the cell into the nucleus where some changes in DNA transcription can take place. In the case of red blood cells in the JAK-STAT pathway, we have a transmembrane protein called JAK, which I'll label like so, which binds the protein EPO, or erythropoietin, which induces red blood cells to form. JAK, in turn, phosphorylates an intracellular protein known as STAT, which travels towards the nucleus and induces more red blood cells to form. So we'll say we get RBC formation. And what STAT does is it enters the nucleus and regulates transcription in such a way that differentiation towards red blood cells are induced. And this pathway is in reality very complicated, but the important thing is to get the concept that ligands can induce the differentiation of stem cells through various intracellular proteins into a specific mature type of cell. The specific JAK-STAT pathway, as we show here, is just one of many similar pathways that can operate in this capacity. Because this pathway controls cell differentiation, interesting things can start to happen if the pathway gets interrupted or modified in any way. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say we have a mutation to the STAT protein so that it doesn't necessarily need EPO to be active. So let's erase EPO from this diagram and we'll draw in a modified STAT protein which still does the same job of going to the nucleus and inducing more RBCs to form. But in this case it does it without the presence of EPO. So what we have is we have increased red blood cell formation even without the presence of the protein that normally drives that process. This condition of having excess RBC formation is actually a disease called polycythemia, in which the patient has an overgrowth of RBCs due to the fact that this pathway is on. There are other diseases, such as CML, or chronic myelocytic leukemia, that can be triggered by specific mutations that allow similar pathways to be continuously active, but in both polycythemia and CML and all these related disorders, only one type of cell is proliferating more than the others. And since all of the descendant cells from that one progenitor cell are similar to each other, they form what's called a clonal cell population, which means that all of these descendant cells are similar to one another in genotype and phenotype, and that's how we can actually identify that this type of problem is going on, if there's so many cells that are similar to each other more than it would normally be. Now we keep coming back to this flowchart between production peripheral circulation and removal, but it's extremely, extremely important because it can help us explain how mutations in the JAK-STAT pathway, for example, which would lead to an increase in RBC production, can lead to a specific pathology resulting in polycythemia. If the balance gets tipped enough in either direction, towards production or towards removal, symptoms might develop, which brings patients into the clinic to be examined, treated, and cured. In the next video, we'll begin to discuss some of the diseases that may bring patients into the clinic.